I'm, I'm not sure you, you really need the, a big microphone, but I just want to thank you all for being here. I hope you've enjoyed your dinner, and I want to know, tell you what a great pleasure it is to be able to introduce such a fine lawyer in person tonight as Joe Reynolds. Uh, his remarks are on a topic that he understands well on courage, as he has observed it both in the battlefield and the courtroom. Now, first, just some background facts about Joe Reynolds. Born November 21st, 1921 in Commerce, Texas. Grew up in Waco, Texas. One of his close friends was Aubrey Stokes. Uh, went through uh, college and high school together. Uh, he attended Baylor University for both his undergraduate work and law school. Uh, the nature of his practice has been uh, primarily commercial litigation, personal injury uh, law, uh, primarily on the plaintiff's side, mediations. Uh, he has been, uh, he's tried over 200 jury cases in different Texas courts, both state and federal, argued cases in the Fifth and the Eleventh Circuits and the United States Supreme Court. Uh, Joe Reynolds has performed magnificent service uh, to both the bench and the bar. Uh, he's been uh, uh, assisted many state and federal district judges by serving as a co court appointed mediator in complex cases. He has assisted with or caused the settlement of multi party cases involving from 200 to 2,000 plaintiffs. Uh, he's uh, also at the direction of the president of the state bar of Texas. He served on a liaison committee for improving the quality of education in law schools in Texas. He served as attorney designee of the Federal Judiciary Advisory Council uh, under Judge Singleton and Judge DeAndo over a period of years. He was appointed by the presiding judge of the Southern District of Texas to serve on the special committee to improve and streamline the bankruptcy court's case law. Uh, and he's been appointed by the president of the State Bar of Texas to a special committee to study and recommend procedures for handling media uh, coverage in the courtroom. Uh, one of the things I think is particularly admirable is that Joe has established a self-imposed pro bono program so as to assist and aid indigent persons in critical need of uh, counsel in litigation. Uh, he's been involved in uh, uh, numerous organizations, uh, the American College of Trial Lawyers, uh, been a fellow since 1962. Uh, he's had kind of an interest in education. He's been a member of the Board of Regents for 16 years of Texas A&M University system and uh, did something right because they named, they uh, built a medical school during his uh, tenure and they named the medical building after him. So it's kind of like having the Janelle Center. <laughs> <laughs> but not really. <laughs> Uh, he's also been uh, on the uh, Special Task Force on Improvement, Chairman Board of Visitors for Texas Southern University, and a trustee from 1982 into the present with Houston Baptist University. He's been a trustee, deacon, teacher of adult Sunday school class, and church attorney for Second Baptist Church in Houston, and gets a real gold star as being uh, exec on the executive committee for the Southern Baptist Convention, he has been the past assistant parliamentarian at nine Southern Baptist conventions. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, here's something that Guy Choate will certainly enjoy. Uh, uh, in 1952, did you know that Joe Reynolds was selected by General Dwight D. Eisenhower as the Korean veteran to be his spokesman in his campaign for the presidency? Mr. Reynolds appeared on nationwide television the night before the day of the election, making a 30-minute broadcast. Mr. Reynolds was also a spokesman for General Eisenhower on many other radio and television programs. I think that's uh, extremely unique. Uh, Joe grew up in what now seems to be like a simpler time when values for God and country were taken for granted, but it was also a tough generation that endured and triumphed over the Great Depression and World War II. Uh, in his resume, it's fairly brief about his uh, service with the United States Marine Corps. Uh, 
It says in 1943 to 1946, he has served with the 3rd Marine Division, Central Pacific and Iwo Jima, Korean War, Battle of Incheon and Battle of Chosan Reservoir, Captain, decorated for bravery and leadership. After heavy infantry fighting at the Frozen Chosen in North Korea, he sustained severe frostbite to both feet, leading his unit on a grueling 150-mile walk to safety. Required over one year of hospitalization to recover. Uh, that uh, doesn't really do justice to uh, what this man has be been through. In talking with Joe earlier, uh, he told me that he joined the United States Marine Corps on August the 7th, 1942, which coincidentally was the day that the Marines counterattacked at Guadalcanal. Uh, uh, and that began, began the great American counterattack against Japan that didn't stop until it reached uh, Tokyo. He was called to active duty on June 1st, 1943 and went to Quantico, Virginia, where he graduated as a second lieutenant in early 1944 and then joined the 3rd Marine Division as an artillery officer. In succession, he then participated in the battles for Kowachalan, Guam, and then Iwo Jima. Uh, on Iwo Jima, Joe served as a forward artillery observer assigned to Able Company 9th Marines. If you'll bear with me, I'd just like to uh, give you kind of a fill-in uh, behind the scenes or set the stage for uh, uh, what I hope Joe will talk about uh, because he will tell us where he was when the flag went up over Mount Suribachi. Uh, but uh, Time Life uh, writes that the Marines captured Iwo Jima to give the B-29s based in the Marianas both fighter uh, cover in a midway emergency field <coughs> for damaged bombers. It was known as Labyrinthine Iwo. It had so many caves uh, that had been enlarged and hardened by the Japanese that it was supposed to be the toughest nut uh, in the Pacific. Only a frontal assault could be made, said uh, the Navy Secretary James Forrestal, who went along with the uh, Navy uh, armada that carried the Marines to the invasion. He stayed, all, stayed in the ships and even went on shore, but watched, he participated uh, uh, throughout the uh, battle. Uh, he said, which left very little choice except to take it by force of arms, by character, and by courage. Selected for the task were the 3rd, 4th, and 5th Marine Divisions. D-Day fell on February 19, 1945. The first waves got ashore all right, but the 22,817 dug-in defenders soon opened up with artillery and mortars, including the 320 millimeter variety. The battle lasted for 26 days, cost 5,563 dead and 17,343 wounded. You know, we constantly, the news is talking about casualties in Iraq and we all, uh, uh, that's a tragedy and everybody hates to hear it, but the scope of the fighting that went on in World War II is just staggering. Uh, casualties, including replacements, exceeded 100% in several infantry battalions and reached at least 50% in all others. 2,400 B-29s made emergency landings on Iwo Jima after it was captured, saving some 26,000 flyers. Uh, then, when the war was over, uh, and uh, Joe was wounded uh, on Iwo Jima, and uh, after uh, recuperating uh, uh, on Guam, he uh, wasn't exactly discharged. He told me that uh, you couldn't get discharged from the Marine Corps. What they did was they just, you went on some kind of a list of inactive duty, but they just, there's no way to get out of yours. You're always going to be in the Marine Corps. So uh, he was, he went about starting his practice of law. He was one of the founding members of the Braceville Patterson uh, firm in Houston and was turning into a trial lawyer. In fact, he had, this was 1950, he had a young baby, uh, he's married, uh, he uh, uh, has just finished trial in one case, is preparing for trial uh, in another two weeks, and uh, they began to hear some news on the radio about North Koreans crossing the border into South Korea. And uh, he gets a, a, a letter or a telegram from the Marine Corps not only giving him t 10 days notice to be on a, a train, uh, t uh, but giving him a ticket to Camp Pendleton, California, uh, saying, you know, we, your further orders will be waiting for you when you arrive in Camp Pendleton. 
when he arrived in Camp Pendleton, they put him on a ship, and in three weeks he was assaulting it in Sean, which was just incredible. I mean, just take people out of just nowhere off the street and put them into a, a troop ship. They trained on board ship. They fired their weapons uh, off the fantails, the rear of the ships, uh, uh, to get their skills up uh, to snuff, and then uh, uh, they threw them all ashore uh, when they arrived, and uh, by God, they won. Uh, at Incheon, he was running a fire direction center for a battery, which Rob has done before. Uh, on the way up to the Chosan Reservoir, which is considered just one of the great heroic stands uh, uh, in history, uh, uh, very similar to the Alamo, except it had a happier ending. Uh, when the, uh, at first, the North Koreans attacked, they went down, pushed all the Americans into the Pusan perimeter. It looks like the Americans are going to get kicked out of Korea. MacArthur makes this brilliant end around. He comes back up to the center, almost by soul, uh, to Incheon and sends 1st Marine Division, which is being patched together from all kinds of assorted units that hadn't worked together up until then because it had been peacetime. And they take Incheon, then they go on, they liberate Seoul, and then they move on into North Korea. And everybody's in, in the process. They squeeze off, they surround, and uh, just De demolish the North Korean army. It's just destroyed. And th then it's just a cakewalk, it seems like, up into North Korea. They go to uh, the North Korean capital. They burn it. Uh, 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 and they're moving on up into the, uh, uh, the northern country, which is mountainous, wooded, uh, forbidding terrain, because you're getting into the mountains of China, and getting close to the Yalu River. And uh, of course, uh, the Chinese begin to send uh, word that if we get close to the Yalu River, they're going to intervene, and nobody quite knows how to take that, if it's a bluff or not. And MacArthur is ready to just keep going and is pushing the Army, the uh, units, to get to the Yalu as fast as possible. The Marine units are s spread along a long road, uh, but uh, the general commanding them is determined to keep the units within supporting units, uh, within supporting distance of each other, the different regiments. And so they're still a tactical group when the Chinese flood into the area. Uh, they've, they've been assembling uh, uh, in ravines and mountain valleys that we were where we were beginning to pick up prisoners and understood that something was going on, but nobody knew what really was about to happen, and then it did. And they overran the Army units uh, and uh, were and surrounded the Marine uh, unit with a, a core of Chinese uh, troops, which was 10 to 12 divisions. And the Marines, uh, 1st Marine Division, had approximately 17,500 men uh, uh, spread along this road, and their task then was to get back, uh, uh, come back intact, bring their wounded and dead with them and their equipment, and get back to the sea where they could be evacuated. Well, the conditions were just abysmal, and this is what uh, uh, Joe Reynolds uh, lived through. Uh, uh, temperatures would be down to 40 and 50 degrees below zero at night. The Chinese suffered horribly. They didn't have winter clothing. They had tennis shoes. You can see old films that show their feet just frozen into solid blocks of ice. Uh, the, the Marines, uh, nearly every Marine that served had some form of an injury uh, or frostbite uh, that required hospitalization when he was evacuated. Uh, Joe said that you couldn't sleep more than 15 minutes at a time at night. You had a buddy system. A person would have to wake you up because if you slept longer, the, the risk was of, uh, not uh, of just dying. So what happened was uh, they had to fight their way back down this narrow, uh, uh, precipitous mountain road covered with ice, 75 miles. Uh, and when they uh, finally came out, uh, the Marines, out of 17,500 uh, uh, men, uh, had suffered 7,500 7, casualties, but in the process had inflicted what's estimated as 40,000 uh, casualties on the Chinese and uh, wrecked an entire Chinese Army Corps. Uh, uh, so, Joe, uh, uh, when asking you uh, uh, if you'd be kind enough to come and talk to us about uh, courage and as you've seen it and the lessons you've learned uh, in dealing uh, uh, 
with situations that involve courage, uh, both in not only the, uh, the military, but in uh, the practice of law. Uh, I'm certainly honored that you would accept our invitation and be here tonight, and uh, look forward to hearing your talk. I'm a coward. <laughs> I want to tell you a story. First of all, I want to say how thrilled I am to be here, and it is a wonderful honor for me to be with you, and I know some of you for a long time, and I've heard of others that for many years, and it's a real pleasure for me to be here with my law partner, Ed Junell. About two years ago, in fact, two years ago this month, a friend of mine in Houston by the name of Archie Dunham, Archie's former Marine, I don't know him that well, but he called me and asked me to have lunch with him. And I wanted to do it, so I went out to his office, and Archie's president of Conoco, and I'd never been in his office, but when I arrived at the Conoco complex, I thought I was back in the Marine Corps. They had a gate out there and a guard at the gate. And when I drove up, this guy didn't have on a uniform, but he walked out and acted like a PFC. And um, he asked me to move over. He was going to drive my car. So I obey, I obey people like that. And he drove me up to this building, and I knew I was in for quite a, an experience. A lady came out and opened the door and says, Mr. Reynolds, come with me. And I walked into the room. I'd never been in this building. And went over. The elevator was waiting for us. It was open, and somebody was holding it. We got on the elevator, and we go up 16 floors. And the door opens, and I look at an office that's about the size of this building. This is Archie's office. And uh, another lady walks up, and she says to me, she said, uh, we're going to, you're going to have lunch in Mr. Dunham's private dining room. And so I think that's a pretty good deal. So I walked into his office, his dining room, and he greets me, and it's nice to see him. And then I notice sitting over there on a small sofa is a man in a blue suit, dark-headed, a smaller man. I'd never laid eyes on this man. And this stranger walked up to me, put his arms around my neck, and whispered in my right ear. He said, did you know you're one of the few men alive who fought in the two greatest battles of Marine Corps history, the Battle of Iwo Jima and the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir. And he said, Joe, I'm Chuck Krulak, Commandant of the Marine Corps. And I didn't know what to say to the man. And I finally said some inane statement like, you know, you've got to be somewhere. And uh, it was pretty dumb on my part, but I was, I was taken back. And he and I had lunch, and Archie told me, he said that, that General Krulak had re retired the previous day as Commandant of the Marine Corps, and on this very day, he was coming on the board of directors of Conoco. And he said there are 20 directors waiting downstairs for General Krulak and, and Archie, not me. And uh, we've got to get him out of here pretty quick. And so General Krulak says, well, I've got to talk to Joe Reynolds, and I've got to visit with him. And so we start, he started telling me about his experiences in, in a desert storm. General Krulak had been commanding general of the 3rd Marine Division in Kuwait. And that was the division I'd been in in World War II. And he wanted to tell me about it. And I wanted to hear it. And so we visited and talked for an hour and a half at that point. And Archie Dunham is having a stroke. He says he's looking at his watch and he doesn't know how to talk to the general. He had been a second lieutenant, and he didn't know how to order this general to leave and go down to this director's meeting. And I felt sorry for him because I wasn't going to help him. And, uh, and so we got to visiting, and time went on. Finally, Archie, he really did, he, he was very rude. He said, uh, General, I'm sorry, but you and I have got to go. And uh, 
I'm being funny when I say he was rude. He was nice, but you don't talk to a general like that. And uh, I don't, in general. I don't talk to generals like that. I, I, I admire, it's federal, I treat them like federal judges. You know what I mean? I respect them, and they're, they're people that you, you honor with your attention. Well, at any rate, I wanted to hear him, and finally, Archie has got him by the arm and leading him out. He says, there are three questions I want to ask him. So Archie stops and nods okay. And the general says, I want to know where you were when they raised the flag at Iwo Jima. Now, I've been asked that question over a thousand times, and I thought he might be going to ask me that question. And it was like yesterday to me. I mean, it was a, a defining experience in my life. I remember it. It was on the 23rd day of February. The 3rd Marine Division was not in the assault group at Iwo Jima. We were in reserve. But on the first three days of the battle, we unloaded ships, we unloaded ammunition, and stacked it on the beach where all the shells from all the Japanese guns were coming. And so it was a very bad time. But nonetheless, on the night of the 22nd, Washington's birthday, we moved into the front line and we took the center of the island of Iwo Jima. The island is four miles long. It's about a mile wide. And at the southern end is this Mount Suribachi, which rises up to a height of about 600 feet. I thought it was the easiest place to on the island. And on the morning of the 23rd, about 11 o'clock, it, it rained the night before badly, uh, and I was lying in a crater filled with mud, and we were fixing to attack a Japanese position 300 yards ahead, and my job as a forward observer was to call down smoke shots, artillery, in order to mask our attempt to take the rest of that airstrip. And somewhere around 11 o'clock in the morning, just before we jumped off, this Corporal Tyler, who was lying in the mud next to me, turned to me and he said, Lieutenant, look back at Surrey Bocce. And I turned my head and I looked back about 300 yards to my rear, and I saw this platoon being led by a guy named uh, I can't remember his name, but he's from Abilene, Texas. And they were going up the side of that mountain. And I watched them. I was fascinated. I was actually frozen watching that platoon go up the side of Mount Suribachi. And when they got to the top, all of us are watching by this time, and we saw them unfurl the Star Spangled Banner and plant it on the top of that mountain. And as I said, that is one of the defining moments of my life. And the crater next to us, where my company commander was, they gave out something that sounded like an Aggie yell. And the <laughs> crater to my right, they started whistling. And this Corporal Tyler and I started crying. But at that moment, I knew that we were going to win not only the Battle of Iwo Jima, but we were going to win the war. The only question I had was how expensive and what is it going to cost us to do it? And about three weeks later, I got my answer to the question. When we reached the north end of the island, my company which started off that morning of the 23rd with 220 men, was down to 19. I'm supposed to talk about lawsuits. I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about my legal career and how the, my life as a Marine impacted my life as a lawyer. I told Les that 
about a year ago, I was taking the graduating classes of one of the high schools in Houston, Spring Bri uh, Memorial High School in the Spring Branch School District, wonderful school. And at that graduation exercise, I told that group of graduates that if I had a thousand lives to live, I'd be a lawyer in every one of them. And I'd live in Houston, Texas. <laughs> because that's the place to be a lawyer. Has been for me. I've been at the right place at the right time. And to see in my former friend and associate guy I chose here has made this all come alive. And I really appreciate your being here, my dear Fred. He started out with me. He didn't like me. That's the reason he went back to San Angelo. <laughs> but at any rate, I have tried to think what about my marine experiences impacted my legal career. And I'm going to tell you one incident. I don't remember the year. Ed probably recalls it. But it was when Judge Tom Phillips had just become a state district judge. He's now, re uh, we understand he's going to retire soon as Justice, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Texas. Well, he was a brand new judge, and I had a case in his court I was defending, and it was a suit by Taylor Hicks from Andrews and Kurth was on the other side of the case, and he represented a Japanese company called Teikatita, and I represented a guy named Tony Sanchez, who just ran for governor recently, his company called Sanchez O'Brien. And we went into this lawsuit. It was for the judge, one of the first ones Tom Phillips ever tried. And in the course of this trial, my Marine Corps experience came out, and it impacted this trial. And that's what you wanted me to talk about, Les and Don. In the course of the trial, I, re I made a Freudian slip, and I referred to the plaintiff, instead of by their real name, I called them Takashita. And uh, nobody left. <laughs> and it sort of slipped out. And uh, I, I like the sound of it. <laughs> so I did this a couple of times, and finally, Taylor. He gets up and he says, Your Honor, he said, Mr. Reynolds knows what he's doing. He's, he's making fun of my client, and he's, this is the worst thing he could do. And he said, I resent it, and I know you do it. I want you to order him to quit. And Judge Phillips says, Well, Taylor, are you familiar with Mr. Reynolds' military record? No, sir, I'm not. He said, Well, I am. And if he wants to refer to your client as Takashita, I'm going to let him. <laughs> tell you a lot of stories like that. I'm not, I, I can stay here all night and tell you war stories and court stories. The other question I've been asked a million times is where did I meet Joe Jamail? Of course, I met him in the Marine Corps. I'm not going to tell you about that story. You have to ask me back because <laughs> that's not really being a lawyer. That's just talking about a lawyer friend of mine. But at any rate, it's, it's a great story and he is my dear friend and uh, Incidentally, next week, he and I are having lunch with the Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Krulak, coming back to Houston. And Archie's been good enough to invite me and allowed me to invite Jamail to come with us. So we're going to have lunch with Archie and General Krulak next week. Let me tell you how my Marine Corps experience impacted me as a lawyer. First thing that I learned in the Marine Corps was discipline. When I went to Paris Island, checked into the Quonset hut where I'm going to live, and I had a couple of guys from San Angelo there with me. One was named Billy Van. I don't know where any of you know him. Some of you do. And I know Don knows him. And the other one was named uh, Max Snodgrass, who was with the school system, I think. And these two guys were in the same platoon that I was in at boot camp. But nonetheless, we had a fabulous time in boot camp, and I learned that discipline 
was the thing that produced a winner. The second thing I learned in the Marine Corps, oh, I was going to tell you about over my Quonset hut, there were some words that somebody had written, and it said this, and I've never forgotten it. It said, the man that knows how will always have a job, and the man who knows why will always be his boss. Now, I don't know where the Marine Corps got that, don't know whether it was a Marine Corps original or not. All I know is on my Quonset hut, that sign was there, and that sign is impacted in my brain. And I believe it. I mean, it's like something I've lived with for over 50 years. Discipline is important to be a lawyer. The second thing that is important as a lawyer that I learned from the Marine Corps is sincerity. And that is when you deal with men who are putting their lives on are putting their lives on the line. Sincerity is the only way to deal with anybody. It has to be right, and it has to be honest, and it has to be fair. And it has to be like it is. And that's how do you ask a man to do something, give his life? How do you ask him to get up out of a foxhole and charge a target 200 yards to his front when bullets are flying at him? You do it, you ask him to do it, and he does it because you're doing it. And you have to ask him sincerely, and you have to bid. You don't try to threaten him. You don't, you say, hey, we're all going. We're in this thing together, and it's teamwork. And the third thing that, the most important thing of all, I learned at the Marine Corps, and I learned it at my mother's knee, and that's integrity. There is no substitute for integrity. And every time you find a great lawyer, and Judge, I know you know this, and I know all of you know this, you find a person with integrity. And that is the key to success in anything that you do. Do I quit now? No. <laughs> I told you that General Krulak asked me two more questions. Archie Dunham by this time is he's biting his fingernails. He's got his board down there that are being stood up. And the general asked me this question, very personal. He said, tell me about the poem. I said, what? He said, I want to know about the poem. I said, General, are you a friend of Bill Barber's? He said, yeah, I am. I said, did Bill tell you about this? He said, yeah, he did. Bill Barber was a company commander, Fox, head Fox Company 7th Marines in Korea. And he was my dear, dear friend. He and I occupied a hospital together for a hospital room for many, many months in Yokosuka, Japan. And Bill was as good a friend as I've ever had. And I said, well, General, I don't know that I can tell you about that poem. He says, I want to hear about it. He says, it's a true story, isn't it? He said, Bill Barber told me all about the story. I said, OK. I said, in the year 1989, my two sons and another boy, Mike, that my wife and I raised, the four of us, the three boys and I, are on our way up to College Station. It's Thanksgiving Day, and we're going up to see a football game. And somewhere out of Hempstead, my oldest son, Hunt, says, Daddy Joe, he said, tell me or tell us about your most memorable Thanksgiving thinking that I would tell him about some football game where a and won. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I thought about it, and I thought about it. And as we got into College Station, and looked up and saw the, that water tower, and we were fixing to turn off to Kyle Field, I said, I'm ready to answer your question. They said, what question? I said, the one about my most memorable Thanksgiving. Well, we came. They looked at their watch. We don't have time for that. We're going to the Kyle Field. 
I said, you're going to hear it. And it is a true story. I wrote this poem, which I shared with my friend later, Bill Barber, and we talked about it. At any rate, it goes like this. One better night near Coterie, I captured one of the enemy. He read my eyes, he knew the deal. He knew at once I had to kill. In broken English, he made request to see the picture in his vest. And I nodded yes above battle noise then stared with him at wife and boys. Go, I screamed, get out of here. And he turned and ran and disappeared. Long I've wondered if he made it home. Or was he buried in Korea's loam? Did he ever again his family see? But I've wondered most were roles reversed how he would have treated me. And the general says, that's what I wanted to hear. He said, what are the circumstances? And I said, after we left Hagaru and we're trying to break out of the trap that we're in, my artillery was not, unable to function, and so I was given the left flank of our column, and I was the point. And just before we got into this little town at Coterie one midnight, there were 20 Japanese, Chinese soldiers that came over a railroad embankment. There was a boy named Francis J. Metter with me. Metter had a BAR. He turned it, squeezed the trigger, and the trigger froze. I took my carbine, turned it on him, and my trigger froze. And that saved our lives. When they saw that we weren't firing, they, they had plenty of weapons, they would have killed us. But when we didn't fire, couldn't fire, they threw down their guns. And this one, he wasn't an officer, but he was in charge of this group, asked me what they were going to do with them. And he said that they wanted to surrender because they were freezing to death. And then he looked at, we, we had no place to put them, no place to keep them. So I told him to get out of here. And we took the other 20, 19, over to the battalion CP. We found a truck. We put them up in the back of a truck. Didn't know what else to do. We were moving all through the night. And the next day, about 9 o'clock, I went over to the battalion CP that was moving. And I asked Major, I said, where are those 19 prisoners I brought you? And he said, well, they're still in the truck. So we went back and told them to get out of the truck. And of course, they couldn't. They were dead. They had frozen to death that night. He asked me another question, but this time Archie is <laughs> having a fit. <laughs> Archie is very frustrated. And the general asked me this question. Do you know what one Marine says to another Marine, Don, just before he goes ashore and makes an amphibious landing on the beach? General Krulak says, do you know what one Marine says to another before he makes a landing? I said, yes, sir, I know. He said, ask me or tell me. And I said, General, I'll see you on the beach. And he took my hand. He says, I want to tell you something, Joe. He said, you'll probably be on that beach before I get there. But one day, 
someday in the future. I'll see you on the beach. God bless you.